Good evening and welcome um, to start off this session tonight. I'm going to hand it over to the CEO of uh, SAMO, and that is um, Mr. Richard Matambu. Thank you. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to discuss a crucial and an ever-evolving topic that directly impacts the healthcare industry, cybersecurity risks. In an age where technology plays an integral role in patient care and the management of healthcare systems, it's crucial for healthcare professionals to be vigilant and to be well informed about the potential threats that can compromise patient data, disrupt healthcare operations, and even endanger lives. The healthcare sector has seen a significant transformation in recent years with the adoption of electronic health records, telemedicine, and interconnected medical devices. While these advancements have undoubtedly improved patient care and streamlined processes, they have also introduced new vulnerabilities that malicious actors can exploit. The healthcare industry's commitment to patient care should, should extend to safeguarding their sensitive information and maintaining the integrity of healthcare services. As healthcare professionals, you have a crucial role to play in the ongoing battle against cyber threats. By staying informed, implementing security measures that are robust, and fostering a culture of cybersecurity awareness, we can all collectively fortify our healthcare systems and protect both patient well-being and sensitive data. And there is no doubt that this evening, you are going to benefit greatly on this critical topic of cybersecurity. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, Craig Roswan, the Managing Director of Wolfpack Information Risk, which is a specialist firm that was established to assist countries, companies, and communities against cyber threats. We are going to have a very good evening today talking cybersecurity. Over to you, Craig. Richard and team, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's an honor to, to speak to some of my members tonight on, as you said, such an important topic. Um, I would like to welcome my co-pilot, uh, Karaba Putiang, onto the call as well. And she's going to be helping with a few sessions here and there as well. So I think just as a quick introduction as to who we are and, and what we get involved in. So it's a firm that I established over 12 years ago. We work very closely with our government in terms of national security issues and a few other governments in Africa as well, in terms of training and skills transfer. And we work with all different shapes and sizes of organizations as well. That typically pays the, pays the bills. Um, one element, which a lot of what we're going to be covering tonight is our community initiative, uh, where I'm going to be pulling examples out from our Alert Africa community. Uh, please listen very, very carefully to what I'm going to be sharing tonight, because it really breaks my heart when we get involved and help, you know, whether it's a pensioner or it's a single mother that's being bullied online or someone that has lost a huge amount of money when they've bought and sold their house, please, uh, folks, pay caref careful attention. This is being recorded. And go and share the lessons that you've learned tonight with your friends and family. Um, everything is going to be recorded, and we will provide a copy of the slides and also links to some of the tools that we're going to show you. So tonight's session is going to be very interactive. I'm going to show you lots of demonstrations. So hopefully it's going to be worth your, your one hour uh, invested in the session. Um, Karaba, over to you. Thank you, Craig. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Karabu Picheng, and I'm a cybersecurity analyst at Wolfpack. Just to give you an overview of what's on the agenda in today's workshop, Firstly, will be the cyber threat landscape, and we'll be going towards how threat actors create fake profiles to target you, your close to you, your finances also. 
And then to conclude everything, we'll be providing quick steps on how to prevent such issues from happening. Rob, I think you've got a bit of a bad link there, if, I, if I'm hearing yes. things correctly. Maybe just um, turn off your, your video. Uh, I know many of us are in the middle of uh, load shedding as well. Yeah, okay. I'll try that. I'm going to... it's better now. Yeah, I think it's a lot better. Go for it now. All right. Just to see some hands, how many of you have Sorry, been Karawa, a victim I of cybercrime yeah. in the last three years? Just for a bit of a moment of it, like the rain. Um, Karabu, maybe you can just switch off your, your video because it's, um, it's a very bad connection from okay. your side. Karab, I think, let me take over here while you're sorting that out. Uh, folks, sure. just a question, because we try to make this interactive as well and personal. Um, if you can click the, the hand button, if you or a family member or your company has been targeted by a cyber criminal in the last three years, let's just get some kind of indication in terms of the our, our colleagues on the call uh, who, who this has happened to. And I'm seeing the numbers going up now, 14, 15 Etc., uh, and the numbers are rapidly escalating now as we are looking at this. And I think, you know, if I have to ask a similar question about if you did fall victim and you went to the police station, how many of you guys actually got justice at the end of the day and the criminals were caught and your money was refunded or the perpetrator was brought to book, so to say? I think I'd see a very, very different uh, show of hands at the end of the day. So once again, Please, prevention is so much bit more better than trying to, to deal with an incident. Thank you so much for, for taking, uh, taking part. I'm going to dive into this now. So the first part is just to give you a bit of a, a brief overview of the, the landscape of what we're talking about here. And as I said, I'm going to be doing lots of demonstrations, showing you some tools that you can use, uh, in essence, making you all uh, cybercrime investigators at the end of the day. So when we talk about statistics, all right, uh, the, the, the numbers are scary. These are global stats. You know, over 4,000 cyber attacks occur every day. 560,000 new pieces of malicious software are detected by companies like us on a daily basis. This is new pieces of malware that your systems are trying to block. And every 14 seconds, a company falls victim to a ransomware attack. We're going to touch on some of these different types of attacks just now as well. And... I won't even try and give you a number because no one's got the, the number of how much money is being lost to cybercrime uh, globally and even in, from an Africa context. It is running into the hundreds of billions of dollars globally. All right. These guys are making huge, huge money. Bringing it a little bit closer to home, Interpol has brought out an African cyber threat report. So this gives us a bit of a taste in terms of what is happening here on the continent and especially very much what is happening here in South Africa. And you know, the big, the big threats that we are seeing from a continent point of view are the following. Don't understand, don't, don't, don't worry if you don't understand what all these things mean. I'll give you some quick examples and then I'll bring, I'll refer to some stories as we're going through. So the top one that we're seeing is business email compromise. And this is where a criminal pretends to be, so they either hack into your email systems and they pretend to be someone in procurement and they issue out fake invoices to your suppliers or to your clients, for example. And your clients end up paying a lot of money into the wrong account. That's a typical modus operandi of a business email compromise. And we've seen this attack happen right from schools where parents in the beginning of the year want to pay their school fees in advance to get a bit of a discount all the way through to someone selling their property they hack the lawyer firm and they pay a huge amount of money for the sale of their property to to the wrong account phishing impersonation this is where they send you an email pretending to be someone trying to get you to click on a link and then stealing your login details it could be anyone from the receiver of revenue to anyone take a lot your google account for example Ransomware and spyware are two key types of malicious software. 
Ransomware attacks, we're seeing companies getting hit very hard where they encrypt your, your systems and they encrypt your backups as well. And they extort money out of you to try and uh, release your information, your systems at the end of the day. Um, spyware, I'm going to give a quick little demonstration to show you how bad spyware actually is. Data breaches, you know, we've seen how companies get hacked and sensitive information gets, you know, uh, put onto on, online. One of the, the recent ones in this sector was, uh, was Discam, for example, who is now being harassed by the data protect or the information regulator who is behind the Protection of Personal Information Act, POPIA, and they are, have been served a notice Unless they do a whole lot of things in the next 30 days, they're going to be issued a fine, and Discam is contesting that at the moment. And then online scams, anything from buying and selling puppy dogs to romance scams to fake sites selling medicine, you name it, there's a scam for it at the end of the day. And don't kid yourself into thinking that, you know, a lot of the stuff is very, very technical, and if criminals don't have the necessary skills, just like you can go on the internet and buy a cloud service, so criminals are offering Crimeware as a service with 24-7 support to the criminal networks that are using this. And I'll show you one or two examples of that as well. So really interesting uh, thing. Now, what we are trying to do here is say, you know, in order to deal with these cyber threats, we've got to start getting cyber security savvy at the end of the day. And folks, um, you know, 85% of attacks that you're seeing launched against companies, for example, are hitting people. So we really have to be vigilant, not even eight to five during working hours or whatever hours you work, but in our home environments where we've got people working from home, protecting our families at the end of the day, protecting our personal finances, our personal safety, we've got to be extra vigilant. And this is a boot camp that's going to give you some kind of training and skills to give you that in uh, in less than 45 minutes. All right, so what I want to touch on now is, what is the approach that is used by typical cyber threat actors? And you see, I didn't use the word criminals only because criminals are one of those elements. They are financially motivated. Scammers pretty much fall into the same category as well. You got a group called hacktivists that might work for your organization and they want to leak sensitive information to cause reputational harm. You've got bullies, for example, that prey on children, on women, on men, and they will try and cause pain at the end of the day. So it all depends on the motivation. Irrespective of the motivation, these threat actors still use very, very similar tools and tactics. So um, what I'm going to show you now is going to be applicable to, to all of those. In our opinion, there's really two ways that these threat actors will, will target someone. One is what we call a shotgun approach, and that's just really a spray and pray, where they get access to a database and they just fire off a message and hope that 1% of people will get worried and pay money to them at the end of the day. The sniper approach is a more targeted approach, where they target you or your family, or they target your organization. A lot more time and thinking goes into that. And I'm going to be spending a bit more time in that area, because that's really the scary one that I, I want to showcase. Let me give you a quick little example of a shotgun approach. Some of you might even have received a, uh, an email like this, and hopefully you can see my, my pen as I'm highlighting something. So this is an example of an email that was sent out, and you'll see that in this message that gets sent out, for example, they said that this is one of your passwords. The spelling is always atrocious with criminals. Um, so they, they actually managed to get access to the person's email address and the person's uh, password, as an example. And they basically said that we've installed malicious software in your computer. We saw that you went on to adult websites and that you were busy watching these things. Now we've recorded, we've got video footage. We've taken, we've hacked into your webcam, for example, and we've got videos of you watching and doing something to yourself while you are watching a porn video. Unless you pay us a lot of money, we are going to send this because we've also hacked into your, your uh, social media accounts and your, your, your email addresses of your friends and family, for example. Unless you pay us this amount of money, we're going to make your name mud at the end of the day. So this is an example of a spray and pray example where they just hope that, you know, a percentage of people are going to pay them the money. What do you do in a situation like this? Thankfully, you can just delete this and move on with your life. Um, 
Now, how did they get hold of your email address and your password? And you say, this is actually a password that I've used on a number of my sites, all right? And really, at the end of the day, your information is sitting, your information and my information, thanks to data breaches that have happened in South Africa and all over the world, is sitting everywhere. Apart from data breaches, companies that you sign up to use various services uh, are sharing, oversharing our information that we entrust them with. I want to give you guys two quick examples. And remember, whatever I'm sharing with you, you're going to be able to go and have a look at these sites as well. Here's the links that we are providing. The first is I'm going to show you how many data breaches are taking place. And the second is I'm going to show you an example of a legitimate service called PayPal. If you're wanting to pay money overseas and not use your credit card on multiple sites, you can pay via PayPal. So um, I'm flicking over to the internet right now to start off doing some of my demonstrations. What you're going to see in front of you here is an interactive uh, view of data breaches that have happened around the world, going back 2007. And the bigger the bubble, yeah, you'll see there's 130 million records. Yeah, you can see there's 32 million records. These are pretty big things, pretty big breaches that have taken place. One billion with Yahoo in 2013. And you'll notice a disturbing trend as we're moving up 2015, 2016, 2017. There's no more space even anymore to actually put the number of breaches that have happened. So data breaches are happening all the time to all of us. You know, if you ended up uh, traveling to, if you've got used any of these services, more than likely your information is sitting out there. If you visited Thailand in the last few years, your information is probably sitting there as well. So thanks to data breaches, our information is sitting out there. And don't forget, about two or so years ago, we had quite a big data breach with TransUnion. We had a big data breach with our uh, data, uh, deeds office in South Africa as well, where over 50 million records were shared. So I can guarantee you our information is sitting out on the internet. The second thing that I wanted to share is how companies overshare information. When I sign up for PayPal, which I use, by the way, I give them my personal information, my credit card, to look after it and to safeguard me at the end of the day. PayPal, in order to render a service, like many companies out there, they outsource a lot of things to third parties, all right? They were forced to disclose who they're actually sharing our information with. So PayPal shares our information with a, a bunch of auditors. They've got customer service outsourcing agents, for example, or companies that they use. And that's where things start to get scary. You won't even be able to see the number of other companies, credit reference, they sell your detail to other companies for financial products. They've got commercial partnerships, marketing and public relationships. I think you get the message. So PayPal might have good security, but all the companies that they are sharing this information of that goes, it goes into the hundreds, folks. What is their security like and how they're protecting our information? So I hope you get the, the picture now in terms of how your information is sitting out there in so many different databases. Let's talk a bit about the targeted approach. We're at the center of everything now is, is you, all right? This could be you, your family, your company, for example. In a more targeted approach, there's a bit of planning that takes place by the criminals or whichever threat actor is wanting to target you. There's a bit of planning. There's a bit of reconnaissance that takes place. There's an impersonation because unless a criminal is really dumb, they're not going to use their, their own identity and uh, personal information. They're going to impersonate someone else. And then an attack is launched against you, all right? And this, as I said, is the, is the targeted attack, the sniper option, right? So I'm going to unpack these four steps and show you a couple of tools, how these guys actually go about doing it. And hopefully by showing you, if you are able to spot this, you're actually able to stop the attack in, hopefully, in the planning and reconnaissance phase, or be able to pick up that someone is impersonating someone um, when they're trying to attack you. So in the planning and reconnaissance phase, there's actually two parts to it. This is the harder part, where it's a physical attack, where someone actually has to come to your offices, all right, or to your house, as an example. I'm going to show you more on the remote side just now, which is a lot easier to do. So let's not forget about the physical side of things. And of course, we live in South Africa. Physical security is normally very, very top of mind. Social engineering is a tactic often used, you know, where someone is able to bypass your security and walk into your offices, carrying 
you know, it's normally someone that uh, either carrying a whole lot of boxes or they go in via the smoker's uh, uh, place where there's normally a brick holding the door open, or they will do physical theft. In South Africa, we've seen um, where your remote, jack, a remote jacking takes place, where they steal your laptop. We've seen a couple of companies where they were targeting them, where they actually targeted executives or people in position of very, very sensitive information on crime cases to steal their phones, to steal their laptops. You might think that your machine is safe because if you've got a password on it, it's maybe a little bit safer, but all, those, all that security can be bypassed. I can guarantee you that. And then there's tech, a whole range of different types of technology attacks. I just wanted to share with you some interesting little devices. And these are devices that you can buy off, off the internet, off Amazon or off various websites, for example. This here looks like a normal little cell phone charger cable for an Apple, for an Android, for example. But this is actually something called an OMG cable that's got an app linked to it. This cable actually has a little wireless chip built into it. So if you find a cable lying around, um, don't just plug yourself into any cable. Don't go into an internet cafe, even in a, a power charging area, for example, or a USB charging thing. Criminal syndicates are actually infiltrating and putting things in place from an app that is linked to this cable. So the cable is malicious. There's an app that activates it. And you can actually install a keylogger on the person's phone to record what they're typing. You can take photos, for example, of what's on that device. If your device is, if your computer is left unattended, there's an example of a USB device called a Bash Bunny. I've got one over here. We look at my, my camera, for example. This little device looks like a normal little USB thing. It's got two different attack modes. You can load attacks on it. You walk up to a machine that is locked. If you push Windows and L and you lock your machine, this thing can be programmed. It automatically detects whether it's a MacBook or a Windows machine. Even though your machine is locked, it actually bypasses that security. And it's got an SSD card in big enough to, to exfiltrate your entire hard drive. Or it can install a keylogger, for example. Uh, that's something called the Bash Bunny. This little gadget over here, small, looks like a little kiddies gaming toy, right? It's called a, a Flipper Zero. This thing has got a RFID reader. It's got a, um, it's got all different types of scanners and it can emulate this thing. If you leave your access card, you can put this thing on top of it. It can actually read your access card and emulate it. I've done this at various high security areas with people's access cards, obviously with their permission, just to demonstrate things. So every time it's copied and I've walked up to the scanner device and I'm able to open up any door, this thing can, um, can record your car, remote, not your car remote, that's a bit more sophisticated, but your garage remote, for example, it can emulate a TV, you can put a TV on off, for example, there's toys, I can show you hundreds of different toys that we, we use when we do uh, demonstrations, all right, so bear that in mind, as a, as a physical or a hybrid attack, these things are available, what I wanted to quickly demonstrate to you is a hybrid attack, and what I mean by that now is you need to get access to someone's phone. If you get access to someone's phone, you can load something called spyware onto that person's device without them even knowing, all right? Spyware, once it's installed on your phone, iPad, computer, it hides itself and you don't see any icon. Um, here is an example of a commercial spyware application that is sold on the internet. And it's sold to, you know, are you worried about your child? Install this on their software. Are you worried about your partner having an affair, put this on their phone, for example. And once this is installed on a person's phone, yes, what you can see from a computer. So, you know, it's installed on your phone, you carry on going to work, going home, etc. From a remote internet connection, I can see everything. Remember your phone has got a GPS on it. I've tested a number of these different devices. You can see exactly where the person is. You can see every single contact on that person's phone, every text message that they received, all the calls that were made and received, or photos that get taken, including sensitive photos. Please never ever have a digital photo of yourself, call it a nude or a naked, or <laughs> we've just seen too many horrible cases where these things end up uh, on the internet. Videos, for example, what Wi-Fi connect networks, logger, so yeah, for example, everything that you're typing on your phone gets logged. That includes usernames and passwords. 
all apps that get installed, whether it's WhatsApp, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, for example, you can actually see what is being said on those chats. So in essence, you basically have full access to what is being the content and the location of that uh, device. That's an example of, um, of spyware, right? And the only way that you're going to know it's there is if your phone starts to overheat, your battery life is not as good as it was, for example. You actually have to do a forensic analysis on that person's device to actually see if it is there, and you have to factory default your phone to get rid of this, this thing because it just embeds itself in your, your device. This is an example of a hybrid attack as part of the physical attack thing. But why, you know, criminals at the end of the day are lazy. Why do I need to get out to your office to try and come and get into them where I can just launch attacks remotely, all right? And this is the scary part now, folks. This means that you, your computer, your device is accessible to any one of the billion people out there. And our, one key thing I want you to take away from this is that, that point. Your devices, whether it's your smart TV or phone, is accessible to any one of a billion odd people out there that is connected to the internet, right? So that's one of the key things to, to take away from this. When a, a, a hostile threat actor wants to target you or your family or your business, the first step that they do is plan. Like starting a business, you have a business plan in place, right? And you, criminals have different types of business plans. Some are focused on romance scams, some focus on online e-commerce scams, others just take a chance, but others, you know, spend a lot of time and money to target specific companies because the payoff is, is really massive at the end of the day. So they have a plan. Normally their plan starts by doing research on you, on your company using the internet. Question to ask is what is accessible on the internet on you or your, your loved ones or your, your business, for example. The second stage is, for example, if you're a romance scammer, they profile their victims. They will go into various social media sites and they will, if they're wanting to target, you know, maybe divorced women or divorced men at a certain age, they will profile you and see based on your pictures, the jewelry that you're wearing, your holidays, your cars you're driving, uh, whether you fit their financial profile as a client, all right? Then they will look at, for example, and th this is just another example, uh, please be very careful about what photos, as I mentioned earlier, that you're posting. Apart from it being used in profiling you, your photos also contain more information than just what you can see. It contains meta information that includes documents that you post online. PDFs, Word documents, these things contain a whole lot of other identifying information as well. And you would have seen this term over here called OSINT. I'm going to do a quick little demonstration to show you. So this, these first three here is doing reconnaissance on people. Um, let me just quickly call up the other ones as well. Yeah, for example, this is a normal little marketing tool that marketers use to look at a company's website to see what technology is being run in it. I'm going to show you something how this is can be used to, to, for, for nefarious purposes. And then we use Google to search for people, documents on the internet. Here is one tool called Shodan that finds devices on the internet. All right, I'm gonna show you something quite scary, how this thing, for example, can find your camera system that you put in place to protect you and your family, but how it can be used against you. So let me quickly switch over to the internet and, um, and folks, if there's any questions, uh, I know my team is busy monitoring the chat. If you've got any questions as I'm presenting, please do uh, type them in before, before we forget. So open source intelligence gathering is not hacking. It's just doing large scale reconnaissance on publicly available information. And this is just an example of a SAT OSINT framework that looks at if I'm wanting to do deeper searches on the internet and use Facebook, I can go to Facebook. But if I'm wanting to do deeper searches, these are all additional tools that I can use to do deeper searches on people or more analytics, for example. And these tools are available. This is only a small bit of, uh, of the tools that are available out there. There are hundreds and thousands of different tools. There's just one, for example, that's got default passwords on every type of technology. So if you are installing your home router, for example, 
and you think, ah, no one can see it, I'll just leave the default username and password on my Linksys home router. Uh, guess what? All right. So let me quickly show you um, some examples here that are that I've uh, pre-put together here. So um, let's start off with uh, with let me start off with uh, the photograph example. The nice thing is social media platforms nowadays, most of them have actually, when you post a, a picture on WhatsApp or on Facebook, for example, luckily for us, it goes and strips out this identifying information. So that's really dropped the threat vector quite a bit. But have a look here, for example, if I have taken a photo, and this is just an example of a photo, and I go and upload it onto the site, there's a site called GeoImager, for example, and what you can immediately see is this thing has gone and said, hang on a second, just based on identifying that picture, it now shows me that this picture, which many of you would have uh, recognized as being in London, uh, in London, here it actually is, and it draws right down to where this, um, this picture actually is. So this could be your child at a school or your house, for example. And obviously we know that we've got uh, lovely tools like Google Maps with Street View, and yeah, you can see how, you know, I was able to just from a picture actually uh, basically walk the streets now and see exactly where we are. So once again, that could have been a, a school or a, you know, maybe a sensitive location that you don't want people to know about. All right. And um, the other thing is, I just went, did this up front. This is metadata on that London photo, for example. So apart from the location, it's got you know, everything about the camera that took the photograph, even what it was printed on, for example. So there's a whole lot of other information. I'm just going through this very, very quickly because uh, once again, just to highlight how this information is available out there to be found. The other thing now is, I'll just use the citizen as a, uh, a sample website just to show you something quickly. You know, you can go onto the internet, onto any web page, and yeah, for example, as a citizen, I can go and have a look around. I don't know how many of you actually know, but if I right click and I say view page source, it actually shows, and you can do this on any website, it actually shows how the website was created and what other areas it actually links to, which other tools it uses, for example, uh, in terms of that. So if I'm wanting to target the citizen and I'm wanting to hack their website, you know, this is an example of what I could do to, to look at that. But to show you, there's actually far more powerful tools. So I've just got a little plugin on that uh, marketing tool um, called What Runs. And this is just if you if you like a website and you want to see what it's what, you know, what different tools it was built with and what it's actually running. Yeah, you can see it actually gives me a whole lot of information on this. I can see that it was created in WordPress and all these other things. For example, now one thing you must remember is every one of these applications that it's using, because it's a technology, it is written in code, there's vulnerabilities that there is databases for these things that you can launch attacks and you can compromise these things as well. And I can even take it a step further by logging in with the professional version of this. And yeah, you can see it's given me a detailed technology profile, a massive amount of information on the citizens website and all the different areas. Yeah, for example, shop is what they've got as the e-commerce platform. I can see exactly what it's built. It's built using Shopify, for example, what's in place, what's been removed, for example, a huge amount of information um, that is available on that website. All right, so once again, I'm talking about remote attack techniques, targeting people, targeting companies, by their websites, for example. And the last thing I want to show you is the targeting of devices. So I've logged into my account of Shodan. Now, Shodan is a very, very, very powerful platform. It can find all kinds of devices online. And as we are starting to move more in the medical field in terms of connected devices, so think about pacemakers, for example, that are connected via Bluetooth or via the internet, or stuff in surgeries, for example, or you know, allowing people to connect to them re remotely, technicians to connect to them remotely. Please always remember that just because it's connected to the internet and you think no one is connected to a Wi-Fi, 
As long as it's connected to the internet, Shodan will find them. Shodan can even find factories, for example, and control systems that are controlling furnaces, nuclear reactors. All of this, as long as it's connected to the internet, Shodan will find it. And just to give you a quick little demonstration, I've gone and typed in a specific uh, camera system, for example, that is um, CCTV cameras. You can see that Shodan has found 60,000 of these around the world. And if I hover over South Africa, you can see that 1,204 of these cameras are located in South Africa. I can even open up a map, for example, um, and I can drill down and I can click right down to Street View, for example, and I can click on a specific uh, camera and I can actually I can actually connect to these things. Yeah, it's just an example of one that I connected to. This takes me right to the back end of the camera system. This could be your Linksys router. This could be your smart TV. This could be your baby monitor. This could be your medical devices in your practice, for example. And when I do demonstrations, if I pick three of them, for example, oftentimes just by clicking login, they don't even have passwords or the password is admin or some other ridiculous password. And I connect to the back end of this device as an administrator. I can take full control of it as an example. All right. So hopefully um, what I've try to share here is that you know typically how reconnaissance can happen remotely sitting in my bedroom sitting in a call center in india or nigeria or china these guys can um, can target you i'm going to leave this quick little interaction just in the interest of time and i want to show something else now as part of reconnaissance criminals need to create a fake persona uh, as part of targeting you all right now, what I want to quickly show you here is if I am a criminal and I'm wanting to target men, uh, middle-aged men, and I want to pretend to be this gorgeous French lady, for example, living in South Africa, and I want to you know, target you on, on WhatsApp, for example, and build a relationship with you. Did you know that there is actually a fake name generator service on the internet where I can say, I want to be a French lady living in South Africa. I want to be between the ages, let's make myself young and beautiful, 19, 19 to 33 years old. And I say generate. And what this actually does is it actually gives me a, a name, for example, of a French person. I can click going until I find one. Oh, Robinette Leclerc sounds quite nice. It creates me a identity document number, even um, burner phone, it even gives me a burner email address that I can activate and use on you. You'll never ever track this person down. I can guarantee you that. And a whole lot of other information. The only thing that it hasn't given me, it hasn't given me a nice, beautiful picture, which I need obviously to, as a flower to attract the bee, right? So, but don't worry, there's a whole lot of other services. I went into, and this is where artificial intelligence comes into, into play. I went into artificial intelligence and I said to AI, create a beautiful French woman uh, wearing a bikini, for example, and you can see it creates this. Maybe I want to say photo of a pretty French black woman wearing uh, a sailor's hat, okay? And with AI, it now within a few seconds, it will go and basically create that. And uh, ladies, don't think that you are being neglected because I could say to it, you know, if I want to impersonate, this is often part of the romance scams where someone pretends to be a soldier, you know, uh, create a gorgeous looking man with big muscles, military guy, and it will go out and create this guy with the steamy eyes that, you know, will melt any woman's uh, legs at the end of the day. So yeah, you can see I've, it's still busy running. If there's time, I'll come back and show you the, the pretty French lady, black French lady with a sailor's hat, all right? I uh, actually went and did that uh, on the, the demonstration here as well. So using artificial intelligence, for example, ah, this was the other one I've created just with a, uh, with a sailor's hat. I'll come back and see, oh, there we go. How about that? And this can create your, your persona creates the most gorgeous looking people, for example, um, and very, very, very believable. All right. And these things won't be found on the internet because this is created personally for, for, my, for my use. All right. 
or the attacker's use. So creating fake identities, for example, and then they go and they launch the attack. And folks, nine out of 10 times, attackers will send you a, an email. Um, so be very, very careful about, if you don't know the sender, be very careful about what emails you open up. We've seen a massive switch to actually targeting you on uh, on WhatsApp, for example, or on uh, Instagram, a whole lot of other sites as well. And then you might even receive a phone call from a call center. Uh, one lady we're helping now at the moment got a phone call from MTN's fraud department saying that there's suspected fraud in her account. They're sending her a one-time password, a one-time PIN. Please can they have it so that they can help lock her account. She gives them the OTP and unfortunately she's just given the, uh, the attackers full control of her account and they've cleaned out her account. Well, in this case, they stole 6,000 Rand from her MTN account. They even do scary things as part of social engineering. Like if they're phoning up a, a woman, for example, they might have a baby crying in the background, which is just an audio file um, saying, please give me this information. The baby's crying, you feel sorry for them. I'm a single mom and you give them information. So they try all kinds of tactics, threatening tactics, pushing you to act you know, very, very quickly at the end of the day. Also as part of the tech, yeah, it's just an example of, uh, these are software tools. This is a, a whole suite of hacking tools that are used by the bad guys and used by the good guys. Remember companies pay companies like us, they give us permission to try and hack their systems so that we can see if we can get in before the bad guys do. And we then obviously share with them how we got in so they can go and patch and harden the, the environments. All right. So, but these tools are incredibly dangerous at the end of the day. And the last thing to mention in this case here is crime as a service. As I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure you also know that, uh, especially in South Africa, uh, collusion is very, very big. There's in many of the big cases we've seen in South Africa, there's often been someone on the inside that's got access to systems, access to information. In this case, we find a lot of the core development team sitting in Eastern Europe, notably Russia. They've got the clever software developer guys. These guys develop the platforms, the, the hacking tools, for example, and they've got various affiliates that buy these tools or they, they take part in the services, for example, and they launch attacks that could be targeting you, targeting your practice, targeting your family, for example, get people to download malicious software um, or hack their information. And this information is passed back to the affiliate. The affiliate has specialist people that know how to turn that information into money, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's hard cash, there's money mills, for example, that they open up account and go and buy things and deliver things, for example. So there's this whole underground economy that works very, very well together. And these guys work together. Here's some examples of an online service if you don't like your competitor, you can launch a site to take, uh, you can launch a service to bring their website down, their service down, for example. Here's another one, for example, a ransomware platform, a ransomware as a service, which you can launch. You put your, you know, the information you got from a data breach, there might be a thousand people in and you launch a ransomware attack against those people. And so the list of tools goes on. This is a remote access Trojan that uh, is very, very dangerous, hacks into a person's computer and you can typically take over their, their computer as an example. Once they're in, for example, they use normal services that you and I use to back up our files and our photographs because these are not seen as malicious and they use normal Gmail to launch their attacks, a more secure email that they would often use as well, which is very hard to trace is something called Proton email. If you see an email coming from Proton mail, be very concerned, all right? It's used by good guys, but typically it's also used a lot by the, the bad guys as well. All this information, once again, will be in your, your information pack. So let's talk a little bit about taking action now. Um, ah, I'm trying to share so much information with you in the, in the time that I've got allocated. Um, at the end of the day, you know, guys, there's, there, there's, so, much, there's so much risk. The, the, the big risk that we see is financial loss. And you can really be taken for, if not all your money, a massive amount of money. We've worked hard to earn this money. We don't want to give it over to criminals at the end of the day. You know, these services that they launch can bring down your, your business at the end of the day. It's exactly what they do. And they try and extort money out of you. Um, we see now that the popular regulator is alive and well. 
starting to issue funds. They issued a fund to the Department of Justice now for, for 10 million rand. Um, they now said to Discam, for example, if they don't fix what they're doing in a month's time, they're going to issue them a fine as well. And this is going to start happening more and more. And then, of course, we need to be very concerned about protecting our privacy and the personal safety of us and our loved ones as well. Remember, cyber attacks go hand in hand with physical attacks. All right. Um, it's just a, a reality of what we see happening, in our, especially in our country as well. So. How do you know that your identity may be uh, targeted, for example? There's a whole lot of things that, are, that uh, are, are available to alert you. You might start to see weird charges on your credit card, for example, credit applications being opened up in your name. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, fake social media pages where a friend or family member's account got hacked and they pretend to be them and try and extort money out of you. You might get emails to say your system's been breached whole lot of other things that can take place. I'll come back to this last point just now. How do you protect against identity theft? And remember, medical information is one of the key elements of what criminals are trying to steal as well, because they can monetize that. They can open, you know, they can do false claims for, for medical aids, for example, or get people treated uh, using your medical aid as an example. There's a whole lot of things that you, you need to do. Um, be careful about unsolicited links in emails, for example. Don't just click on anything. I'm going to show you something just now as well, how to check an attachment if you're worried about it. Tighten your social media settings. I'm going to show you a site, what you can do there. Don't forget about your personal paper documents. Destroy everything. Shred it, burn it before you throw it away. I'm going to show you just now about multi-factor authentication. Subscribe. There's various services that you can subscribe to and lock up personal important documents, all right. Um, in the link that I'm going to share with you, please, this is also the second takeaway. If you are using, and we all are using social media, please make sure you go and you connect to these sites. You know, if you're using Instagram or LinkedIn, for example, or WhatsApp, don't just use your normal default settings, usernames and passwords and security and privacy settings. Follow these links and go and make sure that these Set these uh, applications are hardened. And very, very importantly, they've all got settings that can enable multi-factor authentication. That's where you get a one-time PIN sent to you or this little app that you can you know, validate. So even if they steal your username and your password, they still need to validate via this app, which is a lot more harder to, to get around. And then use the same tools that they would use against you. This is an example of a criminal that pretended that used this man's image and the name Alan Wells Craig, disgrace to the name Craig, uh, and pretended to be the successful businessman and they targeted uh, ladies in a certain age group. One poor lady lost over 6 million rand to the scammer in South Africa, in Cape Town. She ended up selling her house. She lost her business. She sold her car, sold her jewelry, and gave it to this man that she never, ever met. But this is how believable these guys are. When you get a picture of someone, you know, you can right click and you can go and search Google for that picture. Or you can use a service called Pim Eyes. When you search on that person, it will actually come back and show you where that person's face was actually used. You can see that this is actually a, a, a real estate agent living in South America. All right. And then use a service called the Wayback Machine. If ever you want to validate a website, for example, let me give you guys a quick little demonstration as well. Um, so, yeah, you can see, yes, uh, Sama's website, your brand new website that's just been created. This is what it looks like today. All right. Uh, what did this website look like five years, 10 years, 15 years ago? All right. You can go onto the site called Wayback Machine. I've gone and put in SA Medical. And you can see the service goes all the way back to 1999. And you can go and click on any one of these years. So this could be any company that's out there. And I just went on to 2005, for example. And yeah, you can see it's got an archive, the entire website. All these links are still working. All right, you can. So I also use this as an example to tell people, be careful, especially teenagers, be careful what you're posting online, because whatever you post online, stays on the internet. It's like a permanent marker, all right? 
Um, so that's another important thing to, to bear in mind as well. Another thing we've got to be very, very careful about is malware, malicious software, where that's the spyware, the ransomware, for example. And here's a whole lot of indicators that you might have malware on your devices, getting pop-ups, your browser's redirecting you, someone's posting on your social media profile. Obviously, if you get a ransom demand, your security tools actually get disabled, all right? Or your devices is consuming battery or processing power, etc. Your internet is going a lot quicker than you than you realize. And there's a whole lot of things as well in terms of what you can do to uh, to be aware of that. Very important to patch and update your systems. Make sure your systems are backed up, for example. Make sure you've got anti-malware software loaded. Um, what I've done, be very careful. Don't just go and load any uh, antivirus software because sometimes these are actually this is actually malware that pretends to be antivirus software. I provided a link. So obviously a company normally has a standard. Use what the company standards for your work machines. But for your personal use, for example, these are actually really, really good free antivirus software that you can use. And what happens if you receive uh, an email with an attachment that you're not sure if it is actually a malicious attachment or not? So um, just wanted to quickly show you guys something here as well. If you receive an attachment in an email and you say, oof, I'm not sure if this is malicious or not, there's a site called Virus Total that you can actually use. And when you upload a document, I've just uploaded an email that I got that had a remittance attachment, which I was obviously suspicious of. So I went and uploaded it to the file. And what it actually does is it's got 60, 60 different antivirus vendors that actually scan the software. And now you can see that of those 69 picked it up as malicious. The scary thing is that 51 of those actually thought it was safe. <laughs> so bear that in mind as well, folks. That's something that you can, you can use. Just to finish off my talk, um, I just want to share some good news with you as well. We have got an initiative that we've been running for the last seven years called Alert Africa. And yeah, is where we help uh, victims of cybercrime. Uh, we do a lot of practice stuff for, for communities, for schools, for example. And if you fall victim to cyber criminals and you're an individual, a school, a charity, for example, you can report it to the Alert Africa team and we will provide assistance to you. And the good news that we actually uh, want to announce, uh, something that we're going to be launching in uh, November, is a system that is actually currently used by a number of um, governments around the world. So the Canadian Police Department are using it. Um, it's a system that we've codenamed COBRA. And this is really to allow companies like ourselves and other investigation companies and companies, telcos, service, service providers, retailers, to work on a common platform to upload scam emails, for example, that's going to allow our investigative teams and other investigative teams to actually start piecing together, you know, which, which criminal syndicates are doing what behind the scenes and to actually build cases to work with law enforcement and private investigators to actually go and arrest a lot of these buggers that are causing so much damage to, to us. So with that said and done, I thank you so much for your time. If you have got any questions, please post questions onto the chat. And I would appreciate it if you got value from this session. Please respond with a, a thumbs up. So, um, Sama team, thank you very much for your time. I will hand back to, to you, Richard, if you've got anything that you would like to, to add. But, uh, yeah, back to you. Thank you so much, Craig. What a useful presentation that you've given us. And we will allow some time maybe for a question and answer that's um, headed by Ati. Please proceed, Ati. So, Ati, um, any questions from your side that you've got? I'm looking at some of the the chats that have been put through. Thanks very much for the feedback. We really appreciate it. Um, I, see, I think you're still muted.
just while Ati is getting his mic there, I see that um, Sandra has actually asked, do you, you need some kind of antivirus for cell phones? Cell phones, cell phones, especially Apple's, <laughs> are quite hard and quite protected because unless you jailbreak it where you bypass the store, we you download your apps, they're generally quite monitored. Androids, Androids, you know, you've got the, the phone and you've got the Google Play Store, for example. So there's a few more little uh, areas, but phones are generally quite well protected. You do get antivirus. In fact, a lot of those ones that I showed you um, can actually run on a mobile phone as well. So apart from monitoring your phone for malware, it will also alert you if you're connecting to a, you know, if you're going to the airport or a, a internet cafe and you're connecting to a Wi-Fi hotspot, sometimes they can also alert you and say that this is a malicious Wi-Fi hotspot. Generally, folks, I would rather not connect to any public Wi-Fis, um, especially if you're traveling as well. Um, Craig, just to add on the um, antivirus topic, it's also advisable to always update your phones. I know Apple always has a lot of software updates, so that's also very important for any iOS users. I'm just not particularly sure with Android, yeah, but Android always has um, updates. So those are regular updates you need to constantly update. It's so critical. Thanks, Carla, yeah. because... It's not just new functionality that's being added. That often the updates are to patch vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very, very important. Yeah. What other questions can you see there, Karaba? Yeah, I'm just checking. So Tilo Gavanda, or Tilo Gavanda, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, should you restrict access electronic mm -hmm. patient records to limited number of staff? It's a good question. Definitely. You know, think about it. The more the more access that is out there, the more chance of something going wrong. Yeah. And whilst we trust and love our employees, you know, you've got to really do solid background screening on people. Um, you've got to restrict access. And especially now with Popia, you can't just have uh, information. Mm -hmm. People actually do what is called masking. So if it's a call center operator, for example, or someone capturing information, they actually mask out the credit card, not the credit card, well, credit card is also important, but the ID number and sensitive home information, for example, as well. Um, you guys especially have got access to very, very sensitive personal information from a medical history point of view as well. Mm. Okay, so Gerald says, may I walk into your company to assess my devices? <laughs> <laughs> um, Gerald, what we actually do is we've got a forensic, so we're not a forensics company. We've got a forensics company that we partner with that's got a lab. If you do suspect anything, we can put you in touch uh, with them and they can do a proper forensic analysis on your devices if that's what you're asking. Uh, in terms of helping a company to secure the environment, you know, right from your emails to how your environment is set up and what is accessible to the internet. That's where we, we play the part and awareness and training. And I, I see uh, Joanna's asked a question about classes for mm -hmm. seniors to understand all this a lot better. Um, by seniors, are you mean old people like myself, Joanna, or older senior citizens, for example? Um, we definitely, in fact, um, let me just quickly move to the to the last slide and it will be in the, in the pack that gets sent out. Um, we've... I actually brought out a book at the beginning of this year for companies. Uh, it's available on uh, Amazon. But what I often do for South African people, or companies, if you want a free copy of this book, you can just scan the QR code, takes you through to LinkedIn, and you can just um, type in a comment and ask for the copy of the book. At the end of this year, a lot of what you're seeing now, we're actually bringing out a cyber self-defense handbook covering 12 key areas that's going to be very much like what I've spoken about with uh, stories and quite, you know, easy to understand and read um, that can be used to, to raise awareness as well. So definitely. Other questions there, Karaba? Yes. Um, so Julius says, I frequently receive emails purportedly from a government department asking me to submit a quote or a tender. 
I am a general practitioner mm. and not in a position to do such. Is this a, a nuisance email or phishing? The email addresses tested on a different machine are often not working. So these are supplier or procurement scams. What you'll notice is they actually go and create, say if it's coming from Department of Defense or State Security Agency or whatever the agency is, they change a letter or put a number into the, the, the website domain or the email address that it's coming from. And basically what they're trying to do is trying to get people that want to make, you know, want to make an extra buck. They actually would redirect you. Maybe the, the ones we've seen, for example, is where you meant to supply other medical equipment or you meant to supply a pump, a number of pumps, for example. They actually redirect you to a, a fake website where they've got these particular models and they actually pretend to be the supplier of this equipment where they get you to basically say that you've won the tender and you can only buy it from this supplier and you pay 150,000 Rand for the equipment and then they vanish. So all of those things are, are scams. We're actually collating a lot of information and background information on who these guys are. And yeah, that's something we're busy working on because these guys are relentless. Mm. Has an interesting one. Uh, Leondi is asking if customers want to connect to our office Wi-Fi, are there any suggestions for that? Yeah, so generally what you should be able to do in your Wi-Fi is you don't obviously want them connecting to your main business environment. Mm -hmm. You can actually go and create a guest account and you can ring fence that they can only access, you know, certain, basically go out to the internet. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go into technical terms, but that's basically what you can do. What you could even do if you want to be extra secure is you can actually have a separate router with maybe a fiber line that's not connected to your environment at all. You want to still provide service to your guests, for example, and they can go out that way. So that's another way of, of doing it. But you generally can segment it so that they only go out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, there's another question. May I ask which antiviral software you suggest for Mac? Sure. Look, Mac, Macs are a little bit safer than Windows machines, but Macs mm -hmm. are still very susceptible to attack. In fact, there's a lot. Macs have become so popular, and the more popular something becomes, the more it gets attacked. So Macs still need anti-malware. Um, and that, that list that I've shared with you as well, just about every one of those will run on a Mac as well. So um, the same applies for, for Macs. Okay. Anthony is asking, do you have any do you have an idea of the vulnerability of patient databases and records commonly used in SA medical practices, labs, and hospitals? Um, I would have to answer that, Anthony. I think maybe someone on the on the call, if they've got uh, the answer, maybe just type in the answer for that. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, these databases, these, these uh, medical databases would run on common database systems that are, that, you know, a bank might use or other companies might use. At the end of the day, whether it's maybe an Oracle or a MySQL database, these things all have lots and lots of vulnerabilities. So there's actually websites, I can post a, um, a link just now. Uh, with something called a uh, common vulnerabilities are listed for all these, whether it's a Windows machine or whether it's a database and different versions, there are hundreds and hundreds of vulnerabilities and the vendors try and patch with updates all the time, but people are using old versions of software and they're not actually, they, you know, when a hacker scans the internet and they find certain versions that are vulnerable to a certain type of attack, that's when they hit them. So, why do internet service providers allow so much spam to come through? <laughs> it's got a lot better, Mohammed. Um, in the olden days, it was a lot worse. And there was always a little finger pointed because, you know, if maybe half the emails that you're getting are, are spam related uh, and your internet pipe is not enough, you're gonna, what's, what's going to happen? You're going to end up taking a bigger pipe with your service provider, right? So the fingers were always pointed at the internet service providers to say, they weren't incentivized because it was actually giving them more business. But that's all being cleared up uh, a lot more. There's actually an Internet Service Providers Association, ISPA, kind of like SAMA, but for Internet Service Providers, 
where you can report things and they also have to adhere to a code of ethics and things like that as well. So that's a lot better. Okay, there's another question. What is safer to keep your data on a local server or rather on a virtual server, the cloud? That's a very good question. Um, both, are, both can be very secure and both can be attacked at the end of the mm -hmm. day. So cloud providers are generally, it's their business. If they're not secure, no one's going to get them business. So generally a cloud provider is, is very, very secure. The problem is when we're using a cloud service, of, we, we're seeing a number of attacks launched against cloud providers or online service providers. And when they get hit, then they compromise all the people that are using their accounts. I would adopt a, a blended approach and I would have, you know, my very, very sensitive documents kept locally with very strong encryption and protected, all right? Uh, and don't forget about backing up as well, because if you get hit by ransomware, so we're talking about different threats where it gets breached is one thing, but if those, that information gets encrypted and locked down, then you cannot operate as a business. So you've got to think about different types of attacks that can get launched against you, and you've got to take the relevant action. So I would adopt a combination of safe on-site, and then from a... We, we, we can't stop cloud. Cloud is, is becoming so much more, most of our business actually runs in the cloud, but we've hardened it down um, quite a bit as well. So I would suggest a combination of the two. Okay. No, great. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Craig, um, and, 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 and Karabo for facilitating uh, the question and answer session and also for answering all the questions that uh, participants that joined this webinar had. Really, Craig, it leaves us um, with just uh, information to say thank you very much for a very informative session. Um, you really shared invaluable advice about how we can stay protected in this digital world. And to all colleagues that joined this cybersecurity webinar, thank you so much for joining. And remember, cybersecurity threats continue to evolve. And they demand that we constantly pay attention to them and we remain vigilant. So it's important, colleagues, that we stay informed about the latest cybersecurity threats and best practices. So our continuous learning and training of all these changes and how they, they update and evolve is essential. So training is essential, which is the reason why the South African Medical Association arranged this particular webinar, just to keep us up to date and to understand how the landscape with cybersecurity threats um, is, is evolving. So remember that cybersecurity is an ongoing journey, not a destination. So it's a journey that requires us yourselves with the different practices that you made to obviously to protecting digital information. So thank you once again for your participation today, for your attendance. Let's carry on with this dialogue forward. Let's continue sharing knowledge and working together to create a healthcare environment that is not only innovative and efficient, but that is very safe and secure for all. Together, we can build a future where patients can have confidence that their data and well-being entrusted in our hands is safe. So thank you so much. Stay vigilant, stay informed, stay secure, and continue to look at the regular updates that the South African Medical Association continues to give its members and all colleagues on this issue of cyber security threats. Thank you to all colleagues that attended. Thank you. Thank you, Richard and team. Um, we will send a copy of the slides as promised. And uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.